Lane. And welcome again to another repertory, repertory tutorial where we are all developing and refreshing our skills. And we're doing foundational stuff here uh, about the sections. And I just want to go back and look at abbreviations again. You know, even as long as I've been practicing, this is still an exercise that I do from time to time. And every single time, I find some remedy in the abbreviations where I think that has never been there before. I have never seen that remedy before, and I don't know anything about that remedy. And I love it that, I, that homeopathy is one of those things that we just never get to the bottom of. No matter what's going on, it just keeps, there's always more that we can look at. So in this list of remedies that are on my screen today, Sanguinaria, Sanicula, Santoninum, Saponinum, Saracenia, Sarsaparilla, Scutellaria, Sicaeli, Selenium, Senecio, Senega, Senna, Sepia, Serpentaria, Silica. Any of those unfamiliar to you guys? You can't see my screen? Oh, sorry, my bad. Thank you. Let me share that. Oops. Voila. Now can you see? Okay, thank you. All right, so we can see these remedies on the left-hand side. There's nothing there that I can say I've never seen that before. There's a few here where I can say, I don't think I could tell you any major features of that remedy. I don't think I can tell you anything about saponinum. Maybe that it's got a soapy quality in some way, but I don't really know anything else about it. And Serpentaria is a remedy, I believe, that's a little plant that's crawly along the ground the way that Lycopodium is, but that may or may not be true. So as I look at it, I look there and I think, okay, vaguely familiar, could certainly learn some new things about some of that. And then I look over here on the right-hand side, and the first one, abbreviation T-E-T, -T, tetradimite. And I think that truly has never been in the repertory before. When I have opened it, that was evaporated off the page before. And in the 25 years that I've been looking at the repertory, I'm vaguely embarrassed to say that I've never seen that remedy. Have you guys ever seen this remedy? Have you ever heard of this remedy? Me too, who knew? And this is one of the things that I love about the repertory and about the interwoven nature of casework and materia medica and provings and repertory. They're all so interwoven. And as we develop skills in one, it helps us develop our skills elsewhere. So I thought, all right, tetradimite, I know zero about it. I had never seen it before. So of course I went to look it up. So these are rare crystals from North Carolina and Georgia that contain bismuth, tellurium, sulfur, and traces of selenium and iron. Okay, good to know. So these are things that are like, um, we could view this as a remedy that was made out of uh, a ground version of what we get in waters from various wells, like skookumchuk, which is the remedy made from water from a lake in Washington that's got a very mineral rich content. So, tetradimite is going to apply in cases where people have qualities of bismuth, qualities of tellurium in a sulfuric terrain. So uh, Herring actually did approving of this remedy, taking 1x potencies. And I don't know who else was involved in the proving, but I'm going to go study that. I'm going to put this remedy on my study list. And I would bet you that once I'm familiar with this remedy, there will be some time in the next three to four months when somebody will come in who will need just that remedy, which I knew nothing about before. So that's why it's so important for us to go back again and again and look at these things. We always have opportunities to learn more. 
Okay, questions about any of that? You guys can find more about tetradimite, I think, in Allen's Encyclopedia or in uh, Clark's Dictionary of Practical Materia Medica, which is my favorite go-to Materia Medica resource. So, um, yeah, check it out. Okay. And we had talked about a symptom equals a rubric. And what we're going through now is that the symptoms are arranged in sections, mostly in alphabetical order, except when they're not. And so we have a section like mind and symptoms. Oh, hello, Marie. Welcome. My favorite go-to Materia Medica is Clark's Dictionary of Practical Materia Medica. And um, at one point, I'm not absolutely sure this is still true, but at one point you could download the whole thing scanned in electronic form from Google Books for free. So uh, if, you, if you're good at searching around, you might be able to find that. And so it's so... Um, James Compton Burnett and S Cooper and several other really well-known homeopaths in England met once a week. And they talked about cases, they talked about Materia Medica, and Clark was basically the scribe for those meetings. And that's what became Clark's Practical Dictionary of Materia Medica. And so it has the wisdom of dozens of homeopaths who met once a week for many, many years. And all of that wisdom got distilled into Clark's Dictionary. So it's three volumes. It's um, not as granular a level as what we would see, say, in Herring's Guiding Symptoms, which is honestly pretty hard for me to follow. It's not at the proving level of Hahnemann's Materia Medica Pura, but it's also not at that summary level of Borky's Materia Medica where you get four sentences. I need something that's going to give me a little bit more information than that. And so that's what I get out of this one. Okay. So let's go back into arrangements. We've been through mind, vertigo, head, eye, ear, nose, face, mouth, and teeth. And we said that today we would be starting again at throat. And so I want to know, are there any questions from where we've been? Anything that you guys wanted to check in about? Okay, then let's just go ahead and start with throat. Now the throat is interesting because Kent deals with the outside of the throat and the inside of the throat differently. So if we look at the inner and outer neck, but only the front of the neck, now, one would think that your throat is, you know, a tube that has a front and a back. But when you get to the back of your neck back here, that is not included in throat, even though people would say your throat and your neck kind of overlap. In a lot of other languages, they don't have separate words for throat and neck. They're the same thing. But in Kent's mind, they were quite different things. So. We find, oh, thank you. So Kristen's pulled up a link here for Clark's Dictionary to be able to download it. Now, I think that there's two different sections to it because there's three volumes. And I think the first section has like one and a half volumes and the second, yeah, there you go. So this is section two. Okay, um, look in the notes, Marie. Look in chat. 
Do you see, oh, sorry, Kristen, you sent this to all panelists. So I'm gonna, when, if you set all of your, uh, your two to all panelists and attendees, then everybody can see it. Otherwise only I can see it. Okay, thank you, no problem. Yeah, thank you for finding that. Because it's really handy to have it on your computer where you can zip around and scroll through because sometimes you're someplace where your computer or your um, tablet is, but you're not someplace where your books are. So this gives you a chance to look at things. All right, so throat and external throat. The throat starts right at the back of the mouth. So once you get past teeth and tongue and palate, that part of mouth now becomes throat. So the throat includes the pharynx, the very back of, you know, like the back wall of the throat behind your mouth, and the tonsils and the uvula, the little hangy down bit in the back, and your esophagus and the pharynx, this whole part here. But interestingly, a lot of the things that have to do with your uh, voice box, like larynx, those are broken out into their own sections and they don't exist here. So the external throat has the skin and also it contains things like lymph nodes that you would see if it was swollen on the outside. So this is kind of one of those things where people get confused a lot. Have you guys got your repertories there? Can you open them up into the throat section and just kind of flip through there and external throat and flip through there? So look in the external throat section and see what, what can you find in there about the thyroid? What can you find in there about cervical glands, these glands that are underneath? And particularly if somebody has pain here, it would be pretty hard for us as a homeopath to tell is this gonna be in the throat section? Is it gonna be in the external throat section? So your best test question is, can I see it from the outside? If I can see it from the outside, then look in external throat first. If I can't see it from the outside, then look in the throat section first. There you go, so Marie sees goiter. Good, 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 good. Okay, and functions of the throat such as swallowing, are included in the throat section, but cough is not, because cough is considered to originate with the air in the lungs. We couldn't, even though somebody will say, I feel like a, I've got a tickle in my throat that's making me cough, the cough requires the air of the lungs, and so that's why it's not in throat. And everything that has to do with the voice and the larynx, those are things that are going to be later on in larynx and trachea. Okay, so those, the function of cough, the entire thing about it is broken out into its own section and larynx and trachea are in their own section. Okay, any questions about that? All right, moving right along. Let's take a look at stomach. Now, when, when Kent was setting all this up, he put a whole lot about appetite and food desires and aversions in the stomach section that in later repertories have all been moved into generalities. So we have to remember those of us who are refreshing our awareness about the repertory going through here that we might be used to looking for that stuff in generalities and we're gonna to flip to the generalities in Kent's and say, what did he do with it? And it's because it's in the stomach section. So in this section, we'll find everything about stomach pain, discomfort, dysfunction, and a lot of times when we are new to the repertory, 
this is the last place we start to look for something like thirst. Where did you first, when, when you first opened a repertory, where did you first look for thirst? I went to the mouth section because you put stuff in your mouth. And it didn't dawn on me that I was actually going to find that. Oh, all right, throat. You could look for it in throat. Marjorie or Kristen, where did you first look for thirst? Sometimes people look in the mind section because you think you're thirsty. But Kent put all these things into the stomach section. So a lot of times people will look in generalities or throat, wherever for things that end up being in the stomach, unless you are actually um, having difficulty with your stomach. Now, one of the other things about stomach is that clients will say, my stomach hurts. And literally what that means is anything from here down to the pubic bone could be having a problem. People will say my stomach hurts and they'll point right here to the middle of their breastbone. And then they'll say, oh, my stomach hurts and they'll point down to their low abdomen. So anytime any, there's a lot of times not much differentiation in a client's mind between stomach and abdomen, even though for us, the stomach is a specific organ that sits just below the diaphragm, mostly in the center of the hypochondria and it's absolutely above your belly button and so when somebody says my stomach hurts in order to have any idea about whether we're going to be looking for a rubric in stomach or abdomen it's a great idea to ask them can you point and show me where if it's right around the belly button or it's in the lower left quadrant we're not looking in the stomach we're going to be looking in the abdomen section Okay, one other section that's useful in stomach and has been enhanced and expanded in later repertories are things for food reactions. You know, given the number of clients that we work with who have food allergies, we have to know where do we look those up. And so if you, this is a part of food that hasn't gotten moved to generalities. So open up your repertory and look under stomach disordered. Can you find that? What do you see there? What about somebody who's got an allergy to eggs? to milk, to potatoes, to strawberries, to vinegar, to whatever. This is where you would find that. Yeah, list of foods that cause disorder. There you go. So what we're looking for here is everything that is going to disrupt the stomach in a particular way what are the triggers so that's where you find this and there are you can also find some of these uh, how is this different than general's food aggravates um, that would be a great question for dr kent and because in sometimes if you look at them there's quite different content in the remedies now, what I can say is that generals is broader. When somebody says stomach disordered after milk, it means that their stomach feels uncomfortable in some way, like they got queasy or they got a knot in their stomach after drinking milk. But if somebody drinks milk and they break out in hives, that doesn't belong in the stomach section. That belongs in the generalities section because it's affecting the person more systemically. So everything that you see in generals is going to be more systemic. It could mean anything might aggravate, which, right, exactly, yes. Yep, yep, yep. 
Okay, are there any other questions? Can you find a rubric in stomach for hunger that increases when eating? How would you find that rubric? Stomach, appetite, increased eating after. Absolutely, eating after eating, before eating, during. Yeah, good, very good. Marie, you're on it. Okay. So let's now look at the abdomen section. This section is pretty big and it has a lot of unfamiliar words. One of my favorite weird homeopathic words shows up a lot in the abdomen. It's borborygmi or borborygmus. Do you guys know this word? Borborygmus. And borborygmus uh, is gurgling. It's bowel sounds, bowel tones. And remember our session that we had at the beginning about Latin or Greek? I would bet that this goes back into some version of Latin or Greek that means uh, hidden sounds or uh, gurgling of water or something. So if one of you guys want to Google that and find out what the etymology of that word is, we could run with that. So the abdomen does not cover the chest. The abdomen starts from the diaphragm down. Uh, oh, what does clucking mean? Uh, you're gonna have like a bark, bark, bark. You know, if you think of the sounds that a, a um, chicken would make, it's gonna be something like that, as opposed to like a clicking or a tapping or a whatever. And guts make all kinds of really interesting noises. Okay, so, the, the abdomen section goes from the lower rim of the ribs downward into the groin. And it does not include, it's only the front half of the body and the internal organs. So anything that's happening in the back is not there. And specific things like anything reproductive is broken out into its own section and anything urinary is broken out into its own section. But you find a lot of sensations of pain that could be arising and you can't really tell, is this digestive? Is it reproductive? Is it urinary? If you've got something in the lower right quadrant of the, you know, you've got lower white right quadrant pain that is somewhere south of the umbilicus and inside the right hip bone, that could be appendix, right ureter, right ovary. Well, not in guys, so it narrows down for guys, but it could also be a pulled muscle. It could be a, a intestinal issue. It could be so many different things. And so even if we're looking at the pain in abdomen, we also have to look, oh, could this also be related to any of these other sections? So be very open-minded about where you look for things. Now in abdomen, um, would you talk about the difference between hypochondria and hypogastrium? Absolutely. Let's pull up a picture. Okay, can you guys see this diagram? So 
we have these different zones. Epigastric is right up here. Look at how, just as you look at this, look at how big the liver is, how massive that is. An average person with something the size of a rugby ball stuck in their upper or lower rib cage. And then here's the stomach. So we've got the epigastric region, the right hypochondriac, the left hypochondriac, umbilical, hypogastric. So, yes, I will go ahead and post this uh, with the notes for this class so that you guys can grab it. I actually have a copy of this that sits in my um, clinic reference notebook. So you can open it up and show them. Can you show me exactly where it hurts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so there's two ways that, the, that our Materia Medica helps us divide out abdominal space. And one of them is just into quadrants, upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right. And the other one is with these nine sections. And you'll find these references a lot scattered through the Materia Medica. And so this upper part is the hypochondria, the umbilical, the hypogastric. So above, below. All right. All right, so um, one of the things that we for sure want to be able to find as we're poking around in abdomen is the rubric, a rubric for appendicitis. Where are we going to find that? Oh, okay. Marjorie says, Borborygmus Bur says that it's early 18th century Latin from the Greek borborygmos. Okay, so what, where would you find a rubric for appendicitis? We're looking in abdomen. Most people just open up abdomen and they expect it to be right there in the front with the A's, but it's not. So think about what is the process that's happening in appendicitis. We have the word appendix with that itis suffix. And that itis suffix, yeah, exactly, it means inflammation. So we're going to look under abdomen inflammation. Now, Marie, let's be a little bit, just a little bit more specific because there are people who have uh, appendix pain that they feel around the umbilicus. It might not just be on the side. Abdomen pain side right, very commonly, yes. Can we be more specific? You're close, you're getting close. Abdomen inflammation, appendicitis. Actually, in, in my, in Kent's repertory, in the version that I've got, uh, I think it actually says abdomen inflammation appendix. 
Is that what it says in yours? Does it say appendicitis in yours? Oh, wow. Cool, cool, cool. So what I would like you to do is go to the part of your repertory right there at the beginning of abdomen and find in alphabetical order where appendicitis would go and write yourself a note in there because you want to make sure that if you ever need to find that, you know where it is. Okay. All right, so we've gotten through stomach and abdomen. Next time we go into all those things that we can never discuss in polite dinner conversation. So we're going into rectum and stool and urinary organs next time. So be prepared, buckle up. In the meantime, please continue just doodling sections. You're, you should be able to list all the sections in the repertory, whether you can put them in order or not, you should be able to say what they all are. And keep going through the abbreviations, and I'm still learning them, so please join with me and still learn. Get comfortable with your repertory, just have it there by you and flip through it and look at it. That's the very best way to make friends with it. Okay, any last questions or comments today? All right, I will see you guys next week. Thank you and have a good week. Bye-bye.